Is that the ad bell? Hark the herald ad bell rings. He is telling you some things. <laughs> <laughs> He's telling you that we are doing a Psy Guys live show in London at Jamboree on the 26th of September. And we, and he, the ad bell, for he is a he, wants you to be there. But if you can't be there for some reason, like for example, you live anywhere that isn't London or the UK, why would you do that? You can get a digital ticket, which is now available at psyguys.co.uk forward slash tickets. And if you want an actual in-person ticket, you can go to psyguys.co.uk forward slash tickets. So if you want to come and watch us in real life or you want to watch us live on the internet making all the mistakes that usually get edited out, go to psyguys.uk forward slash tickets. psyguys.co.uk forward slash tickets. If you do that, you'll get to see the live podcast, the Q&A, the meet and greet, the interactive quickfire quiz, our special guest Chanel Williams, and the brand new never seen before merch. Isn't that exciting, Luke? Goodness me, I might have wet myself. And 20% off for patrons as well. I've wet myself even more. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Luke Cutforth and this week's special guest Joris Lachen. Hey. This week we're talking about Ritalin rats with a touch of the tism. But first, we have a wee review. This one is an Apple review. Head there and give us a five-star review, please. It says, absolutely great podcast. This is a great podcast for people who like science and people that like listening to random stuff. I personally really like that Corey knows everything and Luke. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's Luke. Right. Anyway, I listen to this podcast every day before bed, and when I'm sad or stressed for some reason, it helps me calm down. Would definitely recommend. Sorry, Luke. Luke's an amazing guy and all. He's very funny. <laughs> I, I get too many comments like that for comfort, I think. <laughs> I actually forgot that that's what this said. I was going to tell you beforehand, but... <laughs> You raw dogged it. I'm also here. I'm also here. <laughs> and I've got a question for everyone who's watching or listening. If you're listening, get down to the YouTube comments and answer this question. The question is, do you have autism or ADHD or perhaps both? Good question. Yes, I have both. Um, funnily enough, I like to say I have ADHD, but I am autistic. But that's just a, that's another debate. But yes, I, I, I have both. What luck that you're here for this episode on combined autism and ADHD. Whose idea was that? That was a really good. Is there anything <laughs> else that ties you to this topic? Well, I... I run a coaching group, the Meerkat Squad, and that also is is targeted towards people with autism and ADHD or people who think they might have uh, both. And because there's very little, um, there's not much research about about it. And um, I had a conversation just before coming here, actually, and it's only this last edition of the DSM-5 um, that has where it, it's acknowledged that it is possible to have both uh, because up until, well, the previous edition or recently, um, yeah, that you either, you could only have ADHD or autism and not both. Uh, but now I guess you have to explain what the DSM-5 is. Oh, no, our <laughs> listeners know the DSM-5. We've okay, got a poster with a DSM-5 on it. All right. <laughs> yeah, no. But I mean, for anyone that doesn't know what the DSM-5 is, Luke, do you want to take it away? It's that book that explains explains things and then says but only if it does only if it affects your life <laughs> yeah okay sure that's, that's, that's what it claims way. it does but it doesn't actually do that for autism but it's uh, yeah. yeah so the dsm-5 is essentially a big book of mental health stuff including neurodevelopmental disorders and whatnot basically if something's going on with your head or your brain it's probably going to be in the dsm-5 and the reason that that thing exists it's the diagnostic statistical manual the idea is to help people diagnose those let's say disorders or disease all of these sorts of things right anything going on with your brain that makes you not like the average normal person whatever that is uh it might be in the dsm-5 and it tells you all the things to tell whether someone has that thing or a different thing or nothing at all. And as Luke says, yes, one of the key points in every single (laughs) entry of the DSM-5, more or less, is if it negatively affects your life, then it's it's a thing. If it doesn't negatively impact your life, stop whining. Just... (laughs) Carry on. More or less. Yeah, but the irony is that, that that principle, they don't stick to it, especially when it comes to autism diagnosis, because it's not based on the lived experience of or the experience of the autism, but it's purely based on external factors or external traits or the way it manifests from the outside. And that also contributes to that 
that idea that that silencing of of autistic people because we don't actually there's there's no not much in the way of of yeah basing the diagnosis or on on the experience of autistic people and it's there's a lot of science that is being done there's a lot of literature that is being made from people from the outside observing autism rather than how it feel from, feels from the inside so and that's also the case for the DSM and which makes it double even more unfair that they claim to do exactly the opposite of that. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing as well. I don't ever want to present it as the be all and end all. I think it's a very useful tool, right, for a lot of things. But there are definitely problems. And you pointed out a really big one at the top of this episode, which I was going to mention later. So well done for oh, pulling sorry. a loop. No, don't apologize. I just realized that the DSM-5 accidentally validates the social model of disability. Yeah. Because if like the social model allowed people to not be affected by autism or anything that's in the DSM-5, then they wouldn't qualify for autism because it wouldn't negatively impact their life. Yeah. Which is really funny. It's I don't, mad, right? I don't think they... Wow, woke king DSM-5. <laughs> I don't think they intended to do let's, that. Let's not go that far. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, what I was saying is that you pointed out something really interesting, which was that you couldn't have autism and ADHD until about 2013, 14-ish, when the DSM-5 came out. The previous edition, the DSM-4, said, I think it was for ADHD. Um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the points of ADHD was, if you've been diagnosed with autism, you don't have ADHD. <laughs> mm. Sorry. Oof, it's gone. Exactly. So the research into this really kind of started in full force only about 10 or so years ago. And a decade is not that long when it comes to studying these conditions, especially when it's developmental conditions that, you know, if you want to do a sort of longitudinal study as in a study over, over a period of time, you've only got 10 years to do that. And hmm. you've also got to get it through ethics committees. You've got to get it funded. You've got to get it actually published. So that 10 years very quickly goes down to, and you've got to write it as well. <laughs> so that 10 years very quickly goes down to maybe eight, seven, six years to do a long study. And ugh, that's not a super long amount of time to get a lot of those out. So there isn't a huge amount of data out there on, let's say, the comorbidity of these two things. But there is some, and maybe we can get into it and also get into the sort of lived experience aspect. But mm -hmm. before we get into any of that, we should probably explain what autism and ADHD are. So let's start off with autism. Does anyone want to take a crack? at defining autism? It's it's a neurotype. Uh, I will go down that route. So it means that it's the autistic brain is wired in a way that is different from the norm or the majority or what is uh, what we would call neurotypical. It's a different way, let's put it that way, of processing information. So information that might be sensory input, but that also be might be knowledge. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so a different way of processing knowledge sensory input and also a um, different way of yeah, feeling emotions and relating with others. So it affects our sociability, the way that we socialize, communicate, express ourselves, relate to others. Um, and yes, yeah, I think that's the broadest explanation that I could give. Absolutely. I mean, you've covered pretty much all of the bases. I mean, if I'm going to give probably the sort of medical science-y definition off the, off the dome here, so in the comments, don't be too mad if I'm, if I'm not spot on. It's generally sort of described as a neurodevelopmental condition. Strictly, we should point out as well that the NHS, everyone would point out that it's not an illness. Um, autism isn't a disease or, I mean, it, if obviously it's autism spectrum disorder, but that word can be loaded in and of itself. It's a neurodevelopmental condition, basically meaning what you've pointed out there, that there's differences in processing information and that can result in a lot of differences from, and I'm using big old air quotes here, the mm -hmm. norm, mm -hmm. because the norm, we can maybe get into a layer, but the norm is a very nebulous and messy idea that when it comes to psychology or um, neurobiology is just, oh, that's a tough one. It's a tough one. But yeah, I mean, you probably know what autism is. If you want to know in more depth, we've gone ahead and done an actual entire episode on autism, which you can watch right now. And also all of the other episodes we've done on autism. We've, do, we've covered mm -hmm. autism a lot. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a quick overview on autism. Just to give you some stats there, about 700,000 people in the UK have an autism diagnosis. Doesn't mean that every, that doesn't mean that it's everyone with autism. It's underdiagnosed, particularly in women, cis women uh, specifically. One in a hundred children in the UK have a diagnosis as well. And um, people of color also for yeah, the underdiagnosis. Yeah, sorry, I, mean, I had to put it there, but oh, yeah. yeah. 
I wonder what. Hmm, I wonder why that is. I don't. I don't know. Uh, but no. Yeah. So and also, autism hasn't been around for a super long time either. I mean, not even. A it's only just invented recently. Yes. Yeah, so at the same time, vaccine... No, I can't say that, I can't say that, I can't say that. We did a whole episode on why that's not true. Go and watch that episode as well. Um, I can't... I realise that if I say that, that's an immediate strike. Um, no, so... No, was it not invented by TikTok? No, um, that's, all, that, that's my No, that's fake autism. That's what oh, you're thinking right, about. Yeah. yeah, there's real <laughs> autism, um, and then there's fake TikTok autism. Very, right. very... The easy way to tell the difference is that if you're about 17 or under... That's fake TikTok autism. Okay, uh, <laughs> we, we can go a little bit deeper in that. I but, mean, I've got uh, the research in front of me, and I think yeah, that's okay. what it says. Well, I don't know, well, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, autism is it. You know, it's I, off the top of my head. I don't think it's been around for more than a hundred years, and if it has not more than two hundred, definitely. By that, do you mean the term? Autism? The term yeah, autism. Yeah, that's what I was the term at. autism, you keep of course. Autism's yes. only been around for a hundred years. Well, so yeah, what, no. well, hold on. Sure. Let's 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 actually like dig into this though, because if I say autism, Autism hasn't been around for that long. That doesn't yeah. mean that what we, you know, we class now as autistic people haven't been around. In the same way as saying, you know, um, there are sexualities that exist now in our current culture and society that didn't exist and couldn't have existed, you know, hundreds, uh, even thousands of years ago, right? So these sort of diagnoses, you can't just think of them as a strict one-to-one uh, with reality, right? They are necessarily influenced by culture. And so when I say autism wasn't around, you know, 100, 200 years ago, I mean what I say. It, like, autism as a concept didn't exist. Autistic people did exist. But autism? It's, it's difficult to, it's really difficult to say that if it's... If we're going to go down that route, it's also important to specify has been around in the West because I've... Um, well, I've, I've uh, yeah, I've done a webinar on that, and I'm currently writing an article um, um, on specifically, yeah, the um, autism as a social construct. Um, but I want to be very clear: I'm not saying that the whole of autism is only a social construct. But there's an aspect of the understanding of autism that is linked to the social context. The experience of autism will be vastly different depending on your social context. And that's where it's also relevant to mention that, you know, there's underdiagnosis among uh, women, uh, cis women and people of color, even more so than it compounds for women of color. Mm. Um, but yeah, and that's because of the social context. It's not because, um, you know, the, 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 their autism brain is any different, but it's simply the fact that we we have learned to spot the traits, the autistic traits, mostly among boys, men, white, boys. white men, Western white, white men. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's why. And also because we mentioned, because you said, yeah, it's not an illness, um, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that it can be a disability, not mm. automatically. Some people may not experience their autism as a disability, but others also do. And both experiences are valid. And mm. that also um, is influenced by the social context, um, among other things. But yeah. That's the difficult thing I find as well, because I feel people will take their experience and present it as this is the only one that you can have. Actually, I'm autistic and it's disabling to me, therefore autism is a disability. Cool, great, your experience, other people may feel differently, and that's okay. I mean, as I said, we've done a whole episode on autism where right. we, we, okay. we really we really dug into that, and I'm happy to get into it again today because mm -hmm. it's a really um, interesting conversation, I find. Uh, but let's get back to the sort of prevalence of it. So that was in the UK. Um, in the US, it's about one in 36 children um, have been identified with autism spectrum disorder. This is coming from the CDC. Um, it's <laughs> They also say, I love, I love the difference between um, looking at the CDC and looking at the NHS. Uh, the CDC notes that uh, autism spectrum disorder is reported to occur in all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. <laughs> glad they mentioned it. Would have taken it as a given had you not mentioned it. <laughs> but, but glad you did, I guess. Um, it's four times more common among boys than among girls, it says, which, again, isn't necessarily strictly true. It's diagnosed four times exactly. more in boys yeah. and girls. We're discovering more now that when you when you teach little girls to be you know submissive and uh, keep keep quiet and follow all these social rules and do what they're told blah 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 um, they will mask their autism in different ways I was actually talking to someone uh, quite close to me actually um, someone I, I know very personally I've known for the entirety of their life um, is autistic and it, honestly it wasn't really 
caught, like, or spotted in that way until too late on, we should say, right? Yeah. It was it was basically, oh, this little girl has anxiety. Hmm. And then said, yeah, well, actually, here's the thing. Um, a lot of girls, young girls that present with, uh, you know, uh, you know, the signs of autism actually are just, they just have anxiety. And I was having a discussion with someone about this and they were saying, yeah, that's a bit mad. It's almost as though you've got the wrong end of the stick because little girls who are autistic will probably present with symptoms of anxiety rather than the other way around, mm -hmm. right? There's, and it's basically you know, feeding into what you just said there of that um, sort of cultural bias that really, really um, infects people's minds, including doctors' minds, including scientists' oh, minds on yes. how they view these things. So that's kind of an overview on autism. Shall we dive on in to ADHD? Yeah, I have a quick question. So it sounded, if I've, unless I've got it wrong, it sounded like you said that the prevalence of like um, diagnoses in children in the UK is about one in a hundred mm -hmm. and in the US is one in 36. Autism has been identified in one in 36 children in the US. That doesn't mean diagnosed. Diagnosis is speaking to a professional and they're saying, autism. That's what they do. That's how they do it. They point at you, they say autism, and you walk out the room, and that's that's your diagnosis. That's how it works. Uh, no, so you get an autism. You get an. Autism, you get an... <laughs> oh, are you TikTok? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no. So I, I I was saying diagnosed in the UK, but identified in the US. That doesn't strictly mean okay. That could diagnosed. be teachers, for example. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is it the moment um, that we can talk about self-diagnosis in the case of autism, or do we do that later? Oh, Maybe. it's up to you. Do you want to talk about it now, or do you want to bring it up later? Well. Well, um, both. Um, let's, no, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's not well, wait. Yeah. When you talk about identification, um, yeah, you, the, the examples that you gave, they were all from outside. And um, but yeah, I think that something that is different about autism than potentially ADHD or other um, other neurotypes is precisely because of the DSM not being based on um, the the internal experience but on out, outer signs of autism um, that doesn't leave much room for self-diagnosis which in the case of autism is uh, very important um, because as we've said there are many factors that may make it impossible for someone to have access to a diagnosis mm. or and so and in the case of autism because it is so much about the experience, the internal experience and the experience of others um, from the inside, um, it is, I think, very important to to make it clear that self-diagnosis is okay. And I know that very often people um, think, oh, well, yeah, but in that case, anyone can fake it. Um, but then I would invite people <laughs> to just think what would be the benefits of that. Shall I um, tell my story? Oh, Luke, okay. please tell your Ooh. story. Please tell your story. So I was having conversations with people and a few people said, oh, have you ever wondered whether you have autism at all? Uh, so I asked my GP just, uh, and and I, I didn't really do the, the conversation very well in that I started with like, they were like, so why why do you think this? Why are you considering this? And I said, well, I've had quite a few conversations where I felt like I was being like perfectly polite and I was just making like having a conversation, but people were, were finding me um, hostile and I didn't mean that at all. And, and, and I know that that's something that, that people with autism describe and it, and it honestly confused me and I didn't have any idea what I was supposedly doing. Um, maybe I'm just not very self-conscious, whatever. Um, I didn't start with other things that people had said um, or experiences I have in my own mind. And the G <laughs> the, G <laughs> the GP said, are you sure you're not just a rude person who wants an autism diagnosis so they can get away with being rude? <laughs> And I yes. never went back. I was just yeah. like, okay, I just, I, who knows? Then. And this is where, you know, as, as you mentioned, the fact that, you know, the, the understanding of it is evolving very fast and we come from not much at all. Um, and, and this is exactly where we might end up with, with let's say, an old generation of, of professionals, of health, healthcare professionals who have the power, mm. like you sit in front of them, they have the power to give you a label that might be life-changing or not. Mm. And very often, because the DSM and because you know the, the mentality is based on the way that it looks from the outside and usually people who suspect that they might be autistic they come with a, a life like a, an entire life of experience that mm. very often is quite traumatic and and so we have this 
horrible clash of I come with my traumatic experience and doubt and questions and insecurities and I lay them out and I tr- and I say can you please help me make sense of that experience and the person on the other side is just like you do not look like they don't they don't receive they don't hear your experience they just base themselves on as the DSM suggests on yeah. external traits and yeah. they're like well you do not look like what you're talking about and so we have this this yeah this misunderstanding uh, and it's it is a traumatic situation and I completely and and that's another that goes to the point of um, self-diagnosis is valid because getting a diagnosis sitting in front of someone who might not be inclined to believe you when you have to share something that is so so intimate about mm. yourself that in itself is scary and traumatic and people who are autistic know that they are absolutely no and i think i want to point out as well that for anyone that knows luke that suggestion is genuinely laughable that's what yeah. i'm laughing at the, the suggestion that i'm sorry, a horrible person the suggestion that luke is a rude person <laughs> who wants an excuse because <laughs> i swear to god luke will see an excuse for himself staring him in the face and avoid it to find a reason why he's actually the problem. Like, <laughs> but no, you're you're so you're so right. And I, I I genuinely and this is something that you know I I don't really think I've spoken about in the podcast before. But when it comes to self diagnosis, I really trust an autistic person to tell me whether or not they're autistic. And I've done a lot of reading on autism, as people that watch this show will know, because you know we've done a lot of episodes covering autism or touching on autism. And you know I feel like I've learned more about autism as an experience from this is don't take this the wrong way people but from like tiktok and youtube from listening to autistic people talk about their experiences i have been better able to interact with the autistic people in my life through watching those videos and hearing about those experiences Mm. rather than reading um, studies and whatnot into autistic people because you know i feel there is a, a bit of a disconnect there um in in b- between sort of studies that are done and between the actual lived experience yeah. and i think the main thing is really getting more autistic people to study autism because if you if you've got someone that doesn't have that experience or doesn't truly understand that experience you've got someone that's like an autism mum and when i say autism mum i don't mean a mother uh, of autistic children i don't mean an autistic mother with autistic children or an autistic mother with any children i mean very specifically the kind of mother who is herself not diagnosed with autism but has a child with autism and their entire personality and their entire life and perhaps their entire online presence is built around the the absolute difficulty and perhaps the joy the as well of, of and sacrifice of raising a boy with autism because it's almost always a boy by the way it's almost always a boy with autism like, um, and specifically a boy with autism as hmm. well that's what they'll say oh, yeah there would be <laughs> that's what I, that's the kind of thing that I can't stand and you see a lot of that kind of viewpoint in in the literature right you see a lot of people not just looking from the outside in but almost looking down at this the people that are trying to find a treatment or or a cure, or basically anything to make autistic people less annoying to them, rather than looking for things to make autistic people's lives, you know, better for autistic people. And in the specific case of autism, we have a field with professionals who may not be up to date and who are actively harmful and dangerous. Um, There was, um, I think it was Dr. Monique Botta, uh, who had compiled a certain... uh, quotes from from um science researchers on autism and and they put together these some of the worst um stereotypes that researchers were saying about autism and they were extremely dehumanizing Mm. and and that exists in in the field of yeah in the professional field of 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 psychologists psychiatrists so this is very dangerous it's very dangerous for people who are trying to yeah, understand their autism. I'm wondering if they are autistic or not. So th- this is, yeah, this is very difficult to navigate and mm. yeah, also dangerous. Well, that's the thing, it, you know, it trickles down actually. What you're, you're saying there about, you know, the awful things that people have said, um, you know, in research about, uh, about people with autism or autistic people. I've seen so many people um, online sort of talk about Asperger's 
which isn't a thing, by the way. It's not, not anymore. It it's, was, It's yeah. just autism. It was a thing. It was, uh, it yeah, was a thing. Yeah, that's how I became, I went from being Asperger's to, well, actually, no, I, I changed identity three times. <laughs> I went from being gifted mm. in France because I grew up in France and at the time, yeah, the, so I was a gifted child. Um, I, I think that the understanding of giftedness is uh, slightly different in the UK and in France. Mm. But anyway. That was the label that was assigned to me by um, psych professionals, um, and then and then over time, my understanding of what had been assigned to me as um, as gifted that changed to oh, that really looks like Asperger now, um, mm. and then that was around the time where Asperger was kind of pushed aside, and we were like, okay, no, there's no such thing as Asperger; it's just autism. Um, so I became autistic. There you go. Well, that's the thing, though. I mean, I, I think we should just quickly touch on the... and also the vaccine of course yeah no, it's, a joke. it's a joke, joke sarcasm sarcasm joke 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 we which actually, camera do joking. i say that all, we genuinely yeah <laughs> genuinely did an episode on vaccines before the whole pandemic happened that was taken down for covid misinformation before COVID even existed. Algorithms that... are not really good at spotting <laughs> sarcasm. Yeah, no, well, no, there wasn't any sarcasm oh, because oh, right. because because COVID didn't exist. They took us down for COVID misinformation. Oh. Yeah, exactly. All oh, right. Anyway, I don't want to mess with the YouTube censors on, <laughs> on vaccines. No, don't worry. Don't worry. We did it. I say we did it. <laughs> Our guest did it in the last episode we did on autism. So you're in the clear. Don't you worry. But um, no, I mean, what, what I think really is really interesting is that you see, how do I put it? There's this sort of Aspie supremacy thing that I've mm. seen kind of bouncing around online. And mm. I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I would say it's an absolute negative thing, right? You you can you can be autistic. That is fine. I will allow that of you. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, no, but um, there is a pushback against the sort of seeing autism as a disability, right? There's a pushback against all of these negative sort of connotations that come along with autism, which absolutely, that is... that all of these negative connotations should be pushed back against. We should dismantle them, get rid of them, all of that sort of stuff, right? But some people then take that step further into saying, well, actually, hold on. That autistic people are really the best people on the planet, right? Yeah. The way that we work is better than everyone else. This is, and I just sit down and I, and I look at it and I'm like, guys, no. <laughs> like, it, it's, it's value neutral, right? Like, yeah. these, these things are value neutral. And... Asperger's, if if anyone doesn't know, it's it's fold it's been folded into autism now, so you can't be diagnosed with Asperger's anymore. Um, the the oh. sort of difference before well, in the UK, it, it's yeah, the, in, the, in the UK it's like yeah, lagging behind. So I, I had someone suggest that I might have Asperger's as I was going through my ADHD process. So really? talking to to specialists, uh, well, specialists, That's, to people, to professionals uh, at the NHS, and one of them suggested that I might have Asperger's, which was in a sense very valid because I was seeking ADHD diagnosis, not autistic diagnosis. So mm. she kind of like confirmed something that I sort of always knew anyway, but using the wrong. Uh, in doing so, she also confirmed how out of date mm. uh, she was at the NHS so I, I, that person yeah. doesn't necessarily represent the whole of the NHS and that was three years ago but still oh, well, yeah. okay so to be fair um, 2013 when the when the DSM-5 came out so the D, when the DSM-5 came out that um, removed the sort of the sort of um, I guess divide between ADHD and autism meaning you could only have one it also folded Asperger's into autism spectrum disorder and in 2021 the ICD um, which is the international classification of diseases basically like the dsm-5 in a different font let's not yeah. worry about it too much that's when um asperger's was removed from that in 2021 but ultimately if we're talking about people that are like in the know with this sort of stuff look the point is that asperger's for a little while has kind of been on its way out and i want to kind of say the reason for that and it's largely because to put it very simply asperger's was just autism but smart yeah. That that is that is it. And the problem with that is that you then create a divide between uh, autism and autism, but people who have a high IQ, and that doesn't make sense because IQ isn't yeah, isn't IQ really it's related. Is, it's not relevant. You know, that's like yeah. saying, oh, well, actually, um, white. It's not just white people. There is <laughs> white people, and then white plus, and white plus is white people with an IQ of above 110. Um, and there you go. If you, <laughs> sorry, you're not white plus. You're only white. Like it doesn't. It, that sounds ridiculous to you, probably, because it is. Mm -hmm. It's it. 
it, it's not it's not related yeah. to the thing you're looking at at all. And I think you did a good job in contextualizing uh, Aspie supremacy by saying that usually this is a, a, in response, in reaction mm. to potentially years of people feeling like they're a failure, people feeling like they're inferior, because that is the experience of, of neurodivergent people in general and autistic people people as well. So when they finally can have a label and can get a sense of, of, of pride and uh, self-acceptance, sometimes they they go to the other extreme, which is, well, I am actually superior. But it's interesting because those are people who haven't, who are still in the process of deconstructing mm. because it's it's not the end. It's not the end of the the process. If you stop yeah. there, you haven't finished uh, your 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 journey. Um, because then you know you you can, you, and you're skipping the part where which is self acceptance. Because if you need to feel superior to accept yourself, mm. then you you haven't done the work. Um, yeah. And I think what I want to add to that as well. I don't think we've said explicitly, but it's kind of been the undertone here. Is that. This isn't just coming from a sort of holistic point of view of, well, actually, Aspie supremacy, in quotes there, um, is bad for holistic people. No, you're you're also stepping on autistic people because yeah. there are plenty, like, you know, it's autism spectrum disorder. There are a wide range of experiences amongst autistic people. There are some nonverbal autistic people. Yeah. There are there are some um, autistic people with learning uh, difficulties and yeah. learning disabilities, right? And to say this group of autistic people are, in fact, the best people on the planet. Um, we are smarter than everyone else and we don't need to deal with those silly social rules that you all get bogged down in. Like, dude, that's not really, like, it's, it's fine if if um if if the sort of if you have a difficulty sort of I say let's say um intuitively understanding and engaging with you know social rules or situations or whatever, that's fine. That's a value neutral thing. Yeah. It doesn't it, also understanding that is a value neutral thing itself. Mm -hmm. All of these things are entirely neutral and no one is better than anyone else because yeah. they can or can't do it. That's like saying uh, people that can run a hundred meter hurdle are in fact the best people on the planet. Why? Because I put value on the hundred meter hurdle, hundred meter hurdle, hurdle, and I've arbitrarily decided that that's that's the determining factor for the best people on the planet. Uh, but we should get into ADHD. Yeah, sorry. Clearly, keep, we're, yeah, we're, we're almost displaying that there. So <laughs> ADHD, uh, does anyone want to take a crack at uh, sort of just briefly defining ADHD? I would say uh, a neuro developmental disorder which affects executive function and probably something else. Yeah, it's pretty much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, ADHD. Um, word for word from the DSM-5. <laughs> <laughs> uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, now, in the same vein as Asperger's, I want to quickly say out there, if you've got ADD, no, you don't. I'm afraid you have mm -hmm. ADHD, but likely it's just inattentive. Oh, hold on. Is it inattentive type? Yeah. Yes, inattentive type. So what happened there was we had ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and then we had ADD, attention deficit disorder, and basically, if you weren't hyperactive um, on the outside, you had ADD. If you were hyperactive on the outside, you had ADHD. They've not been folded into the same thing. Um, it's broadly split into three types. Um, inattentive, um, hyperactive, or combined, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and like ultimately, I feel, in my experience of people with ADHD, most people display... You know, it, they may lean heavily to one side if they're if they have one type, heavily to another side if they have another type. But most people display at least some from you know uh, the the type they don't have, if that makes sense, <laughs> right? If you're inattentive yeah. type, you will still probably split, display some hyperactivity there. But um, yeah, so ADHD, it is a yeah a neurodevelopmental condition disorder that affects attention that affects um executive function a lot of different areas and yes the kind of the kind of way it's viewed is oh bart simpson is hyper and doesn't listen to rules and that is a really poor way of viewing it because it means that you know for example people like me slip through the cracks for example right okay so i've said this in the podcast because you before. do not look like bart simpson i look exactly like bart simpson. <laughs> thank you thank you very much <laughs> he is yellow no um no but what i mean is that you know um the idea is that people with adhd are bad in school not necessarily the case i was good in school and you know mm. why school is easy for me very like i'm very good at just reading a thing and remembering the thing and understanding like understanding the concepts in school and all I found it very straightforward, to be mm. honest, right? And if I get interested in something, easy. Yeah. I was interested in science. I mm. was interested in all of the subjects that I did to like, you know, throughout school. So 
very straightforward and easy for me. Did I remember to do homework? Nah. Did that matter because I got good grades anyway? <laughs> there you go. So uh, I think I just want to pull apart people's sort of preconceptions of what ADHD and also autism are because they're not necessarily just what you think you are. I think, Luke, when you said that they affect executive, what well, ADHD affects executive function, I think that's probably the best way of looking at it mm -hmm. because when it comes to the difficulties of living with ADHD, pretty much all of them come like uh, are related to let's say um executive function or impulsivity generally when you see people talking about them that's what that's the kind of trend that i see either you're not able to do something or you're not able to stop yourself from doing something you know uh, but yeah that's a uh, broadly what adhd is interestingly enough um autism also affects uh, executive functions which is less known um and yeah that's usually are you reading my notes man uh, are, you, are you looking at you you're skimming ahead sorry, well, no, go yeah. on go on go on <laughs> that's also well yeah it, it so there are many overlaps like this one for instance but it tends to manifest or, or affect people in different ways but yeah autism also uh, covers um, executive function which is uh, something that my colleague um, Sheila Henson talks a lot about because earlier I said that I was um, one of uh, yeah I, a, a coach for the the meerkat squad but it's important that I mentioned that I'm one of three mm -hmm. um, so I didn't start it myself uh, so there's also Sheila and Lena my, my, my colleagues who uh, yeah, there's three of us. I'm not taking credit, all the credit for me. I uh, thought it was important hey, that I mentioned that. Meerkats, Roman packs, we know about that. That's all yes. good. No worries. <laughs> but yeah, so let's just quickly cover the uh, prevalence and some stats on ADHD, and then we can get into the real meat of the episode. Yeah, so I mean, if we look at it globally, in kids, it's about 5% of kids are estimated to wow. have ADHD. Mm. Yeah, which at that point, right, 5% of people. That's more than there are gingers. True. Like, it's more Do than I there are. Do I have a hair condition? There's more than there are, like, people in many countries, right? Yeah. You know, um, when you look at it that way, it's not terribly uncommon. And if you look at it as just a sort of, this is disorder, this is a, a way your brain goes wrong. Well, is it that or is it just another neurotype? Right. I mean, if we really break it down, neurotypicals, uh, and that's meaning people, you know, that don't have a, a neurodivergent um, condition or a neurodevelopmental disorder or anything along those lines, are neurotypicals even all the same neurotype? Probably, probably not. Right. Probably not. The thing is, that we've spoken about this before in the episode that we did about Freud. When it comes to psychology or anything to do with that, that sort of area, you know, when it comes to people and how they work, <laughs> putting people into boxes is very useful, but we need to remember that the boxes aren't real. And when we draw very hard lines around these boxes and say, this box is a real thing, and everyone in it, they are defined by this real box. Bad thing to do, probably yeah. gonna get yourself into some trouble. Earlier, when we were talking about all of those terms that keep changing, and for, for people listening, it might sound like, well, you know, that that's so many labels flying around and then one minute you're this and then the next minute you're that but it's yeah it's also important to remember that those are labels and mm. labels can be useful uh, so if it helps you then by all means use the label but uh, some people are not comfortable with la with labels so you know that all 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 of those uh, positions and relationships with labels are valid to some people having a label such as autism or ADHD is validating because it confirms that their experience or things that they've experienced all their lives, it lets them know that other people have thought about it, other people have theorized about it, studied it, and so it's not all in their minds. Because and they're not alone. They're not like, alone and, it's, and they did make it up. So to, there is value to labels for those who want them. And it's kind of like gender as yeah. well. It's it, like all of those labels, the, the exact boundaries are completely arbitrary and and made up but if it if it serves you by all means use it if it does not serve you do not feel uh, like you have to submit to them but also do not try to impose a label on others uh, or deny the labels that they choose for themselves oh yeah absolutely i kind of want to piggyback off of what you were saying there with gender i'm gonna go back to one of my favorite little analogies that i use Luke, do you remember this one so oh god yeah oh, no, no not that one okay. no that one the good one the good one so um, i mean yeah, no. that was pretty good but <laughs> no, just take Luke, some explaining stop 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 so gender i 
I kind of see it as being somewhat similar to color, right? So if we look at green and blue next to each other, right? It's a little gradient between green and blue. If we zoom in as, as far as we can into the middle of that gradient, what is that color going to be? It's going to be an exact, like exactly in between green and blue. Now, if we zoom out, the difference between green and blue is quite obvious, right? You could be like, that color's green, that color's blue, that color's green, that color's blue. If I was to ask you to point at some, like if I was to point at something and say, what color is that chair? You'd say that's a blue chair, okay? That's fine. But when we get into the sort of colors in between, it gets really difficult. People can disagree and we have to come up with new names. Like I've, I asked this question in a YouTube video at one point. I was like, okay, what is this color? A, an exact mix of green and blue. What would you call it? If it's, it's either green or blue, which is it? People said teal and I'm like, well, there you go. You've just proven that <laughs> if you've mm. got someone that is not exactly, you know, fitting into either of these two boxes and they're like right in the middle and you're trying to decide which one they are, coming up with a new label is something that we do all the time. Yeah. It's just being more specific, right? You know, if you want to say that there are only two sexes, male and female, and you do a lot of finagling to try and get everyone who's intersex into either of those two boxes, you can maybe do it. Would it be useful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In some contexts, in most contexts, probably not. Regardless, there are going to be those fuzzy little edges there. And a lot of people live in those fuzzy edges, yeah. right? And so thinking of these boxes as hard lines rather than gradients with fuzzy e edges, sort of spectrums, things blending into each other where we draw lines, same as species, right? If we look at evolution, right? At what point did the red jungle fowl become the chicken? <laughs> I don't know, because at one point there was a red jungle fowl, and then at another point in time there was a chicken, and at some point halfway between that there was a cross between those two or something evolving from one into the other. You can't do that. You can't just draw a line between, you'd have to literally draw a line between one organism and its offspring. That's like saying, okay, I'm a human, but my son, my son <laughs> is human plus. I don't know why I'm using plus so much. Well, yeah, I would say you can do that, but you have to be aware that it's arbitrary and that it, you know, it's a made up decision. Absolutely, yeah. You can do it if it helps, if it helps if it's people, a model, if it's yeah. useful, then yeah, do it by all means, but also remember that it's made up. It's 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 a social construct. It's it's dependent on on your culture, your perception. Draw the lines, but remember the lines are bloody arbitrary, yeah. right? Like, oh gosh. And we look at things in such such a sort of large scale so often that species seem. And that's why I like bringing that one up because species seems like such an obvious thing to someone. If I say to someone to find species, they probably say it's two. Uh, it's the group of organisms that can you know. Uh, produce fertile offspring with each other. The same thing we all learned in high school biology. I'm sorry, high school biology is simple. And mm -hmm. there's a reason for that. It's because it's for high schoolers. <laughs> and compared to high level biologists, they are rather simple. No yeah. offense, high schoolers. Lots of us are too in the area of biology. But the point is that you need to kind of break your preconceived notions. But there we go. That's kind of an overview of ADHD and autism. But why don't we get into the sort of comorbidities when they kind of come together within the same person. In perfect chaos. Yes. <laughs> Ling, that's the ad bell, and we've cleaned up Luke's Wii. I'm so happy to be free of piss and here to talk to you about Sci Guys Live in London. Whether you want to smell Luke's piss in person or you want to see it on a screen online, you can get a ticker for that at scyguys.co.uk forward slash tickets. And like we said, you get a live podcast, you get a Q&A, you get to meet and or greet us. And you get a quick fire quiz and see our never before seen merchandise. And not just see it, you can get your grubby little mitts on it. And for the exchange of monetary things, you can take it away with you. But you can't take away our special guest. Who's that? Janelle Williams. You, you know that, Luke. Fantastic. Well, get your tickets now at sideguys.co.uk forward slash tickets for the 20% discount for patrons. My piss is not guaranteed. It is guaranteed on you if you don't get a ticket. And that is a threat. Let's get on with the show. <laughs> get on with the show. <laughs> So let's talk about the comorbidity of autism and ADHD. Just right off the bat, throw me out a guess at the... I don't actually want you to guess this, George, because you'll probably know it. Look, throw me out a guess at the range of estimates for the comorbidity of those two. Somewhere between 10% and 30%. <laughs> Oh, I can't wrong. believe how, <laughs> I can't believe how bad that guess was. I'm sorry. It's, so estimates wrong. go as low as 37 percent and as high as 78 percent. What? Yeah, you are like not even in the right. So range. my top bar was like below <laughs> the bottom bar. Yeah. 
Wow, that's <laughs> so high. It's very Pi, high, right? just give you an autism diagnosis immediately after your ADHD diagnosis the, at this rate. Dude, the number of papers I've read where they're saying, yeah, so we should probably start testing people for both if they come in to look for one. Because yeah. it saves time, right? And so, I mean, I've, I say I've already mentioned this. George already mentioned this. Um, the the DSM-4 specified that an autism spectrum... Uh, disorder diagnosis is an exclusion criterion for ADHD, thereby limiting research of this common clinical co-occurrence. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean that was <laughs> that was back then. And bear in mind, it, what I want to what I want to really point out is that autism is still as a as a sort of concept is still developing. Mm-hmm. Again, we we thought that, and people still think this. Like I, I genuinely was watching a documentary the other day, wherein someone said. Oh, I didn't realize that my, like that I could have autism or my girls could have autism because I thought autism only happened to boys. And yeah. look, I understand why people think that culturally. Sure. I understand where they get that information from. But knowing the sort of let's say having some insight into genetics and biology, having studied biology at university, biotechnology to be 100% clear. Um but knowing a little bit about that, I'm just like what would what would the actual mechanism there be for autism only existing in boys? It's on one of the chromosomes. <laughs> it's on the Y chromosome. It's on one, yeah. on one of the chromosomes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whichever one, I can't remember which the one. Y, yeah, yeah, the y, yeah, but like, but even that, like, oh yeah, autism is located on the Y chromosome. Exactly. Like, <laughs> what? But um, yeah, no, it's 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 really interesting. Um, it's it's been developing for some time. Again, initially it was just little white boys, and now it's little white boys, and sometimes anyone else they can be bothered to look at. Yeah, um, and <laughs> yeah, I am an example of that as well oh, because yeah. yeah, because of the. They they miss and I think that this speaks on the the TikTok autism um, thing really mm-hmm. well. Is that a lot of people? Yes, it is true that there are probably and I'm one of them. Uh, people who who realized that they were autistic thanks to TikTok, um, but it's not that TikTok had turned them autistic. It's just that there is such heavy mis- misconceptions around autism that suddenly having access to other experiences of autism that did not fit those um, stereotypes and misconceptions allowed so many people to realize, wait, but I do have that too. I didn't think I was autistic because I don't do this or that I because like I have friends. Yeah. I don't like trains or I, I'm not like completely obsessed with maths mm. or, you know, I have friends. For me, the, the main thing is I felt hyper socially aware mm. as opposed and and i had always been told that you know, autistic people were people who were basically completely oblivious who couldn't c- create meaningful uh, social connections and i was like well that's not me but funny enough i get on really well with people who are exactly that stereotype yeah. <laughs> like, I, I seem to be friends with the cool kids and also the the nerds and and people who turned out to be autistic mm. later but i was like but I, I can't be autistic myself. Uh, so, the, yeah, that was one of the main reasons. Something um, I've heard from a couple of people as well, if we're, if we're talking about this, which I, is so painful just to hear, is that people, I, I've known a couple of people that are like, oh, well, actually, no, I, I didn't struggle to make friends. I was really popular in school. You know, I was friends with the popular kids and they kept me around and, oh, they were bullying me and I didn't mm-hmm. realize. Uh, like, there's, like, you know what I mean? If you, th- this is something we've spoken about many times on the podcast because it comes into so many different areas areas of you know life wherein you know your perception limits or not necessarily limits but your perception controls what you can understand right so if for example you have a fantasia you can't really see images in your head you're going to think when people say oh picture it like you know picture it in your mind's eye or whatever that they're being entirely metaphorical mm. and that you know you just got to think about the thing and then you find out that other people can actually see pictures in your in their head and you're like wait what this doesn't i i don't understand that right so for someone who is autistic um and perhaps has a little touch of black white thinking and all of these sorts of things and takes things very sort of literally you might misunderstand some of the some of the descriptions of autism and not even yes. realize that those are the experiences exactly. that you're having yeah yes, yes so autism and ADHD there there are this is the thing we've spoken about a lot of this already there there are a few things that sort of overlap lap there. We've already spoken about the different sort of prevalences that, I mean, there are so many different estimates here. And when you take into account as well, the underdiagnosis of both of these things, particularly in um, some groups of people, who knows which groups of people, it's always the same ones, um, <laughs> you know, it, it becomes it becomes an even more complex issue to look at, right? So um, 
I did find this uh, sort of study that was looking at, um, I think they, I think it was a, oh gosh, I think this was a review that looked at a bunch of different studies. But anyway, um, so what it's got here is looking at um, the overlap between autism, ADHD, and intellectual disability. Um, mm. And what they found was that in a population of kids diagnosed with autism, uh, autism spectrum disorder, um, the rate of ADHD and autism was 42%, and the rate of ADHD plus autism plus uh, intellectual disability was 17%, which had a total 59% total uh, comorbidity rate of ADHD and autism, which is, like, mad. And then it also points out that there are um, differences in age of sort of noticing differences, parents noticing differences in their child's development, um, also differences in age where medical uh, medical sort of help was um, sort of sought. Uh, th- like, you know, there are there's a lot of interesting information in this. Actually, you should go and check this one out. This one is the comorbidity of ADHD in children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder from 2016, linked below as all the references are. But the average age of diagnosis was over six years for kids with autism and ADHD, but close to two and a half for kids with autism only. Mm. So when there's a comorbidity there it seems as though it can impact how long it takes for di- for you to get a diagnosis or you know for uh, you know um, any of these sort of differences to even be found in the first place yeah because some of the key traits of either autism or ADHD can be cancelled out by the other neurotype mm. so you so depending on yeah when you look at the diagnosis criteria sometimes it may look like you don't have well, in my case, for instance, there were when I was going through the ADHD diagnosis, there were a whole series of of questions that did not apply to me, but I, which I didn't think. I just thought, well, you know, that's that's fine. Not mm. everything. I can't tick all the boxes. That doesn't mean I'm not ADHD. Uh, but now looking back at it, I realized that those specific areas were cancelled out by my autism, and that's the reason why it didn't apply to me, and vice One versa. One is masking the other. Right, so yeah, you know, you've... sometimes they can be masking the other. Sometimes they compound. Oh, literally canceling yeah. out. You mean like actually yeah. like destructive interference? Like literally, one cancels the other out. That is well, mad. yeah. I mean, yeah. And, but also because we're talking already about two spectrums: ADHD and autism. And even mm. people would use rather than a spectrum on a line, they would say it's a disc, or mm. you could even say it's a sphere, um, where like you can be on any given point in that that space. Uh, so we're already talking about things that are, as you said, very fuzzy with very fuzzy edges so if you look at the the overlap of two fuzzy mm-hmm. things that also exists on the spectrum so mm. some people's some people who are ADHD so who have both autism and ADHD they might they might feel like that ADHD affects their everyday lives much more than autism other people would, for other people it would be autism that affects them much more and it it's also highly dependent on the context Absolutely, maybe yeah. someone will face more more difficulties with their ADHD at work but once they're at home it's their autism that that influences their experience uh, so that changes within uh, among people and also within the same person depending on the context that can be also completely different so well, it's yeah. a huge range well, yeah I mean if you think about it right let's say your job is something where you need to motivate yourself, right? You need to do a lot of your own work. ADHD is going to make that bloody difficult, right? Yeah. It's going to be it's going to be hard if you have self-imposed deadlines or it could be hard, you know, depending on your experience. But um, you know, if if then your social life is you know, very full with other things, then that's maybe where autism is something that's more sort of recognized. And you know, you if you if you've got a job where you don't need to speak to other people, you're probably not going to really ex- yeah. like like notice any issues regarding autism at work because it, it the things don't come up if you're entirely in sort of under your own um sort of purview that's probably more likely to fly under the radar i mean if we talk about these different uh, sort of diagnostic criteria almost canceling each other out or masking each other one of one thing that um, everyone i would say almost everyone knows about autism is the routine aspect yeah. of autism right we won't get into necessarily the sort of underlying cause of that but if we make a if we make a very broad and simple statement that many autistic people find comfort in routines right if we make mm-hmm. that statement absolutely a lot of people with ADHD can't stick to a routine to save their goddamn yeah. life, right? And so when you see these two things uh, like working together, or rather working against each other, I've, I've heard people talk about how I need a routine to feel comfortable. 
but I cannot stick, stick to a to routine yeah. at all. So I'm constantly <laughs> <Yeah>. stressed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is yeah. like <laughs> it's the case for many people with ADHD. Or yeah, um, or an, an example where, in my case, I experience it as as cancelling each other out. Is for instance, yes, I have ADHD, but that I never lose stuff because. In my house, oh. it's always a mess. Like you know, it's it's very messy, but everything has its own place. Uh, and I have my routine, so whenever I leave the house, I know exactly. It's it's like muscle memory almost where the keys are. I grab my keys, mm. and so you know, and that's so that's the autistic side that mm. helps me counter the 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 messiness uh, of the ADHD. And in that specific aspect, I would say that it helps. Um, but there are other situations. Uh, notably around uh, executive functions mm. that, where they compound and they uh, both kick me from both sides. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes one of them is like on your side and sometimes both of them. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, this is the thing. And I think the reason that I want to do this episode is, you know, we could say, yeah, we've got an autism episode. Yeah, we've got an ADHD episode. We've actually got a wealth of those because we can't shut up about them. But, mm. That doesn't really that doesn't really get into the experience of both. It's almost that intersectionality, right? Being yeah. uh, is it harder to be you know what is it <laughs> um, a white woman or a black man? You don't is it harder to be yeah like a white woman or a black man? You don't go to ask a black woman to say like hey which of these things is harder for you because you can't separate out those things, right? Yeah. That's that's a key point of intersectionality there. Wherein if someone is uh, you know both black and a woman that creates a unique experience where those things interact with each other um, in such a way that you can't sort of extricate them yeah. to to make an experience that is either of those things and the same goes for you know having both autism and ADHD or being both autistic and having ADHD right they it creates a unique experience wherein you can't just say ah, this is all autism, this is all ADHD, yeah. and this is where I stand in the middle, necessarily. Yeah, and also because people do not have any reference points. that They've never experienced trying not having autism for a mm. week to see what what is actually just the ADHD. Um, so You really never try. You should give it a go, yeah, yeah, honestly. Yeah, I, I, I reckon try. you should, because um, like, yeah, just ADHD free. works fine for me. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, funnily enough, it's almost, that does not necessarily apply to ADHD because there's, treatments there's medication for adhd so we could say mm-hmm. that we can get a taste of what it would be like to not have adhd when you're on medication I would argue so that we then... can't, though i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna sit here and people always want us to disagree on this podcast and we're finally doing it <laughs> look i would say that if you were to take medication for adhd it doesn't make you not have adhd yeah. i still have problems with executive function even on medication like sure it gives me it makes these decisions easier it makes it smoother but I still can get stuck doing literally not a single thing yeah. because I've taken the medication and it's it's given me the drive, but I've not directed myself enough in the right way. So I'm stuck in this. You know, it's like um, it's like saying, uh, yeah, just because someone, you know, in a wheelchair gets in a car doesn't mean they're not they're still not a, disabled, you know what I mean yeah. like um it, it does increase your mobility in in some ways but also it it limits you in other ways you know there are places mm-hmm. you can go in a wheelchair you can't go in a car yeah but um but yeah no I see I do see where you're coming from wherein there aren't really there's not really any humane <laughs> let's see <laughs> yeah that'd be right. there's not any huma- humane way to well, have an autism an autistic yeah, person not experience to, what yeah. it's like to be autistic yeah but um, yeah there's no point. way but like yeah. the ways that people say are just Torture, mostly, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We can get into ABA, but no, because this is mm. not a purely autistic episode. Uh, yeah, no, let's. But <laughs> let's um, you were, you were talking about executive function there, which I find mm-hmm. um really interesting, right? Or rather, executive dysfunction. Um, so it, it is known that autism and ADHD both are associated, and um, and it says as well, or some in some cases defined by executive dysfunction, but. People, and this is something I find is taken out of context on TikTok. And I don't want to make it as though I'm like, you know, um, saying TikTok is bad. TikTok is a great resource. Unfortunately, while you've got people that are educated on the subject, that uh, that speak, you know, from research and from lived experience, uh, you know, you, there's many others. Um, gosh, what was her name? Dr. In, uh, I'm not Dr. going to remember. Anna? Dr. Inna, is that her name? Well, if that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. yeah if, fantastic yeah, as well. A, yeah. You know, she's great. Um, and many other people that speak from you know education experience. There are also others that will do a quick skim read of 
you know, uh, something, and then come on to say, you know, actually, autism and ADHD are the same because they both have executive dysfunction. No, they both are in, are and related to executive yeah. dysfunction, but in different ways. I mean, yeah. uh, what, I've, what I've got here, I'll just read verbatim. We can discuss it a little bit more. You know, it says children with autism spectrum disorder have more planning and cognitive flexibility difficulties, and children with ADHD have more inhibition difficulties. Right. So the way that you, the way that this executive function sort of manifests, and the exact sort of exact sort of things you have sort of difficulties with aren't necessarily going to be the same even though they all technically fall under the purview of executive dysfunction yeah but that's precisely one area where i wouldn't be able to tell you know mm. the difference although oh, because yeah although with medication um i do find it easier for instance to to get started and to focus which is what it's supposed to do so that aspect of executive function um, you know, just getting the starter button to, mm. to work, um, that does help. But now what is exactly the the autistic aspect of executive um, dysfunction that I experience? I, I wouldn't be able to precisely tell. Yeah, so. I suppose, actually. That does, that, that's another thing that we've not really mentioned yet as well, is that these things sort of working... Um, like being being sort of present in the same person means that it's very hard to extricate, as we've said, it's hard to extricate those experiences. Yeah. But that would also mean then, okay, which of these things is which, right? What is that? And that's when the, this idea of sort of categories, I think, kind of becomes somewhat problematic, right? Wherein you're trying to decide, okay, does this go in the autism box or the ADHD box? Well, it actually goes in the Joris box, mm -hmm. and all all of this is just Joris stuff, right? Like we. Oh, that's how. That's why we came up with the meerkats, term. <laughs> uh, because yeah, because meerkats they live in community, they live together, but mm -hmm. they're also always paying attention, looking around. Mm -hmm. um, so they're always focused and distracted at the same time. Um, but um, yeah, what was the connection with autism? Now I forget. Um, but anyway, yeah, <laughs> meerkats, ADHD in action. Yeah, no, but um, absolutely. I, I, I find it, I find it quite interesting, right? Um, and if we talk about executive dysfunction, right? So, for example, I mean, a lot of autistic people could go through burnout, and you know, obviously, if you're realistic, you can also go through burnout. But there's kind of some unique aspects of burnout when it comes to autism, right? Yes. If you got, to, if you got to think about it this way, right? A lot of autistic people are just masking pretty much constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, even amongst loved ones, people they've known for their entire lives, um, you'll find that when people are diagnosed with autism, that's when they start to work on the process of unmasking. Yeah. And I mean, even around people close to them, it's like, oh, this is this is not a, this is a different person than I'm used to sort of interacting with in some in some ways. That's still the same person, but like there are some differences in the way that we interact. And if you if you think about, you know, all of the stuff that you have to deal with just just as a person going through their life, imagine having to have another sort of program running in your brain at all times, you know, being like, you wait, hold on, do it this way. Don't do not do the natural thing for you. Do this other thing that you need to put effort into remembering to do. Yeah. All of that sort of stuff. And then also you've got textures that are stressing you out and sounds and sensory inputs that are just too much. All of that coming together where is like where is the sort of rest right because mm -hmm. you can't always rest take a rest from um you know sort of sensory inputs you can't necessarily uh, unmask at all times and there there are so many other things going on especially it might take it might take more effort and more work for you to do certain things and if you've got to leave a routine for example that can cause a lot of stress and then suddenly you're burnt out and you can't do anything and you're unable to in some cases unable to care for yourself right yeah. like there that is something that could absolutely happen and that's not necessarily the same thing as me having ADHD and feeling 100% fine i'm just waiting for the time where i'm able to do the thing mm -hmm. is it time yet i don't know wait till the man clocks on and tells me yeah, yeah? <laughs> and then that can turn into anxiety as well yeah. so it, it it can affect you negatively but yeah it, absolutely it's not the same as being over yeah having your your nervous system constantly being attacked by too much too much information or you just not having the ability to to sort out the information um and yeah so that that can easily lead to to, to burnout um and yeah autistic burnout can be much more i would say deeper but yeah it, it it affects you in in much more holistic way mm. and um yeah in, in in the physical ways more than just being tired but that also affects your emotions um 
because I, I like to say, and, and that's not scientific, but I like to describe my experience of autism as uh, thinking with emotions. So, you know, mm-hmm. which which we tend to, there's this misconception that, that autistic people do not, well, do not feel things or do not emote or do not, uh, don't have empathy, but I would argue, and some people, some autistic people I actually have come out to say, no, I, I don't have empathy. That's not, that's true. So mm-hmm. I, I, I accept that. That's not my experience, but I, I don't want to invalidate their experience. But I think that a lot of it is pr- simply because we express it differently. Or, um, mm. But um, yeah, what, what I was trying to say is disentangling Detangling, disentangling, disentangling, yeah. Dis- disentangling um, feelings and and thoughts, and it's is for me it's the same thing. So when people tell me that I oh. overthink, it's like no, I don't overthink. That's the way I feel. Um, so where was I getting? What? Oh yes. So um, that's so, yeah. wild. Okay. Like yeah. thinking and feeling are very separate. I can think my way out of a feeling yeah. if I really wow. Me, I think with emotions and I feel with thoughts. So depending on where you. Where you look at it from, it may look like I overthink mm. and over intellectualize my feelings. But also, people might f- say that you know I get too attached to thoughts and to yeah. uh, and and so because they for me they're one and the same. So you know for many many years I tried you know, all the self help and even in therapy you know I tried to like stop intellectualizing my feelings and tuning into my feelings. But I think now I'm getting to the point where I'm like, maybe I don't need to do that. Maybe I can just accept that this is part of my neurotype and I think with my, I feel with my brain and that's okay. Um, And so where I was getting at with this is that when you cannot separate feelings and and thoughts and you have an autistic burnout, then that means that both those aspects of your life are affected so you can't the way you feel and also physically so that that yeah that's that's physical that's uh, cognitive that's uh, emotional all of that gets burned out so that's much deeper than other types of burnout or maybe just the ADHD burnout and that's yeah. a, like, that's a very different experience from mine I just want to hop on what you said about empathy there because I, I think something that's often missed is that people will say autistic people don't have empathy and that's very much not the case as as a rule, right? You know, as, as a whole, you can't really say that. I think what people are getting at is there's different kinds of empathy, right? You know, there. I, I mean, I was watching a video about this the other day on TikTok, sorry, but mm-hmm. it also related to people that I know um, personally. Um, they were We were talking about this. And the, the thing was, they were like, I, I don't get when people say I don't have empathy because if someone says they feel something, I feel that feeling. Yeah. I feel it. Um, and I was like, okay, that makes that makes sense. Mm. So that, that is empathy. But then also another part of empathy or a different sort of type of empathy, if we, if we want to look at it that way, is being able to like sort of intellectually sort of understand someone's feelings yeah. and not necessarily feel them, have that sort of separation and know what it is that they would want to be done in that situation, mm-hmm. right? So empathetically being like, okay, like this person feels sad and what should I do for that person that feels sad? I could, could, should console them in this way that they mm. that they sort of, you know, would, that they would like. And if you're, like, if you are less able to do that sort of second one and you very much feel someone else's emotions, if, some, if someone feels sad around you and you it just immediately you. feel sad and it, it affects you, that's going to make it more difficult for you to display you know, sort of that outward empathy yeah. that that person is looking for. And mm-hmm. so it could, you know, result in essentially people saying autistic people don't have empathy. When actually what, what it means is some autistic people are unable to display this external form of empathy yeah. because mm. of their the intense internal experience of empathy. And also, I guess, picking up, like, as you said there about the idea of like when I, when I'm, told when someone says that I'm that they're sad mm. I feel sad with them but people don't generally go I'm feeling sad that you pick up on a cue that that you sort of infer their sadness right and if if you if you don't pick up on that specific cue that you can from which you can infer their sadness then you're not you're going to look like you're not empathizing yeah. with their sadness but actually you might have just missed something say but missed something I want to hop on that as well because that's another thing that relates sort of uh, between autism and ADHD in that people say oh actually they're really similar because um ADHD people can have issues with social cues too I don't have issues reading social cues I'm not paying attention. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, look, I know how, like, if I was paying attention to any of, like, someone will be like, oh, this, and I'm like, yeah, that, that makes sense. That all makes sense. 
I wish I was I wish I was mentally present for it, but I yeah. wasn't. <laughs> you know, um, and the sensory stuff as well. Um, sort of the other side of that is that sometimes at parties, I am entirely unable to pay attention to one particular thing, <sighs> and I'm listening to everything at the same vo like every voice in the room is the same volume and someone's talking at me and I'm like look I'm, I'm listening to you I'm gonna be listening to you I'm gonna have to look around the room so I'm able to listen to you and pay attention don't think that I'm not interested it's the only way that I can listen to you <laughs> without hearing every other voice and how is the that same experience level. when you cannot separate the, the the input in in a in a group conversations for instance I just space out How, okay <laughs> I don't right. like I, I just I mean I think I, I just space out and I find myself I find myself doing that in meetings a lot as well without realizing before diagnosis I was just like man oh what am I, what am I thinking and, oh, oh I'm in a meeting yeah what were they saying <laughs> you know that sort of thing and that's very interesting because I also really struggle when when I try to have a conversation with someone and then there's other things around it but I think that the autistic aspect of it is that it makes me extremely uncomfortable. It makes me want to shout, explode, because I'm just like, shut up! Because, yeah, I want to, and, and that, that's why I'm quite very often uncomfortable in group settings, mm -hmm. it's because I try to speak to one person, but, and also I feel like I have a, like a, overview or a, a, like a bird's eye view of the conversation so I'm whilst I'm trying to pay attention to the person who's talking to me I can also I'm also following the other conversations whether I want yeah. it or not yeah. oh <laughs> and, <laughs> and it gets very frustrating because I'm like do you not listen to each other because like, yeah. I feel like I'm the only one who's paying attention to what everybody's You're saying conversation at once, yeah. and 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 I, but that also means that i pick up on the misunderstandings and the things that that yeah. person said but that person mm. didn't get it and now they're going off on a tangent because they misunderstood and it's like <laughs> it's just too much for me and i'm like listen to one another please yeah. i can't be the only one doing this but uh, yeah to go back to to the the, the overlap what you said about uh, the about social cues and the misunderstanding i think that there's also the misunderstanding in the it, for, for autism um, and again I will speak from my experience and the experience of people that I know share with me but that doesn't mean that all autistic people share that specific experience but I don't miss or I don't misunderstand social cues I I pick up on them but I may not know what to do with that information yeah. so it's not that I did not understand it I'm like oh that person is being aggressive that person is trying to overpower me now that but i may not or that person is feeling sad and is actually the subtext is that they are asking for compassion and they feel yeah. unheard and frustrated actually i feel like i pick up on more cues than other people but it's the what we do with it that is and what is expected of me with that information that i may not feel have a appropriate reaction but it's not because i didn't understand it it's I, I don't know what you to do with this. You have a social script for it. And yeah. that, kind of goes, exactly. that goes back exactly to what you said right at the top, really, which is about the DSM-5 being overly mm. focused on external, yeah. is that that would look like you don't pick up on the social cue or you have inappropriate responses to social cues or whatever. But actually, it's just that you're like, okay, I picked up on everything, but... I don't necessarily know what I'm meant to do yeah. with that information. And, and again, <laughs> when you give that information to a group of people who are in some ways defined by a quite literal thinking, you're going to run into, pro run into problems. Like I've yeah. been seeing so many people come forward and say, oh, you know, I didn't realize I had literal thinking because I, I, I thought, <laughs> It, I thought about it very literally and I didn't yeah. realize that literal thinking was the thing that I, I was, was doing. doing yes. <laughs> um, and it's like, hey, look, it, it's, it's very funny. It's, it's not great. It's, an, it, it's indicative of a number of problems in, in our society. But also, it is quite funny to miss literal thinking by thinking about it too literally. Um, and again, it just shows how poorly um, sort of we, we describe these things for people. But yeah. I think it's also uh, sort of compounded by the fact that we have these stereotypes around what an ADHD person looks like and what an autist, mm. autist, autistic person looks like. In the, like, the ADHD kid in school to me was like the naughty one, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm. And so then you necessarily firstly out of want to, wanting to fit in and also because you're not adhering to the stereotype that you have you you think of yourself as oh, I'm, not, I'm not an autistic person I'm not an ADHD person so then you kind of get confirmation bias where like if there's something that 
someone says something that like, this is what autistic people will do this is what ADHD people ADHD people do and there's like some way in which you could it, misinterpret it mm. in order to uphold your view of yourself as not being an ADHD yeah. person mm-hmm. you might do that because you 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 don't think that that's you because you you you're adhering to this you you think it's like they all adhere to the stereotype so it's not me yeah. I just want to uh, that's that's so true I, you know what's really interesting it reminds me of sort of some people that I that I know who have come off as being very cool and the, the thing is that they are very cool but the reason people think they're cool is because they don't say very much and the reason they don't say very much is because they're autistic and they don't know what to say and it's just like it really it's really funny to me that you that you sort of like stumble your way into seeming like really cool so and mysterious. suave so and mysterious, mysterious. <laughs> and it's just, you're just like I have no but idea what to say like, in this situation. oh is this the moment that I try oh no oh somebody's saying but, something else oh what were we talking about ah but I wanted to say something three conversations ago but to hop back to what you were saying before about being very aware of all these social cues do you think that might be because you feel the need to be so aware because you're not sort of necessarily intuitively just picking up on them you're like you know in sort of almost subconsciously making the effort to pick up on them you know well so yeah thank you for this question um (laughs) i i think that there's a part of that is well so some people explain it that way so that that analogy i didn't come up with it um, but I, I really like it. But it's it's uh, you know how autistic people they can have special interests and they can really dive really deep I- into those mm. special interests. And for some autistic people, their special interest is people and the mm, way that they think. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and and the thing is, the difference very to make it very simple, the difference between autistic people and holistic people, so the people who are not autistic, certain things will f- be natural. So they don't have to think about them. It's just it's just the way it is, especially when we talk about socializing and interactions and conversations. It's something that they might not know as toddlers, but they learn and they pick up on and it's they mm. don't even think. Whereas for autistic people, we don't have that natural thing. So that means that we have to observe and to study people. And the thing with autistic people, if some of them, but some of the autistic traits is when we study something, we are thorough about it. Get into it, yeah. So this is how you might end up with the other extreme with autistic people who are actually really, really good at studying, observing, picking up on things that holistic people would not pick up on because for them, it's just like a normal thing. Whereas for us, we're ex- extremely attentive to that and almost sometimes hyper attentive. So this is how you end up with certain aut- autistic people looking like, well, appearing that, you know, they can't be autistic because they're highly socially aware. They pick up on on on, on cues and they, mm. and actually, no, it's literally also their autism that does that. Yeah. It's not that they it's an autistic trait that they don't have it's they have it to a an extent and in a specific way that makes them hyper aware and and hyper attentive yeah and do you know what you brought up hyper fixations there and special interest i just want to briefly touch on those before we get into maybe some underlying causes and then try and wrap this massive topic up (laughs) but um people will say also that hyper fixation and special interest are the same very simple way to differentiate the two if if you forget about it after like a month, that's not a special interest, bro. That's not <laughs> like, look, I mean, I, I, the, the number, if you go through the drawers in this room, do not. If you go through the drawers in this room, you will find a number of abandoned projects, a number of things <laughs> that I'm like, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And then it's in a drawer and I'm like, oh, wait, this thing. <laughs> yeah, I forgot entirely about that. Whereas if something's like a special interest, like you could pick up more throughout your life and maybe like some will kind of like uh, fade and kind of ebb and flow, but they're more constant than a hyperfixation, yeah. I would imagine. And with say, someone imagine. with <laughs> ADHD, I can have both. So they have long running... What a treat. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they've, I've got my long running high well special interest and mm-hmm. then some rabbit holes that I fall down for days or weeks and and or sometimes I go back to old special interests that had been dormant for a few months or years and then mm-hmm. I'm back at it. But yeah, so I'm not autistic, right? But every now and then for a period of maybe a whenever a new Pokemon game comes out, I you know this Luke, I have to take time off work. I used to take two days off work. Now that I'm self employed I will work a 40 hour week of playing Pokemon. I literally, the first week the Pokemon game came out, I, I played it for 40 hours. Wow. Yeah, I have a problem. I can't <laughs> put, I physically cannot put it down. So if I start, there's no stopping me. But 
it's 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 not something that is like it, I, the, all the knowledge I've got on it is because I retain knowledge, and every mm. single time I've just gotten really deeply invested in it, it's just stuck there. The same with literally everything I talk about on this podcast. Like all of the like the people sometimes are like, "Corey, what's the answer to this?" And I'm like, "Stop." asking me questions. I don't know the answer to all the questions. I will, if I don't know the answer to this one, yes, I will find it out and I'll tell you and I'll remember it for the next time someone asks me, but I don't know things. Stop pretending like I know things. I have a collection of facts that I've <laughs> gathered accidentally throughout my life. But it's very much, I, I don't think that there's anything that I could point to and I'm like, yeah, this is something that I'm like, I'm like hyper obsessed with and have been like the Simpsons, but also again, just being really, really intensely invested in something and being unable to lose information from my brain. It's also just the dopamine, I reckon. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good, Luke. <laughs> also, the sort of social interaction stuff, right? Like, I, like as a kid, I struggled to make friends because I was annoying as all hell. <laughs> I still am, but I'm better at pretending I'm not sometimes. And so you're masking I'm, being annoying as all hell. Oh yeah, buddy, and this is a thick old mask. <laughs> and also, you're in a social position that rewards some of that. What oh, you yeah. would have been annoying then, um, yeah. That's why I have a podcast to just mm -hmm. feed my ADHD. Get to do a new thing every single bloody week got deadlines every week oh do i get to be annoying on camera yes i do but also like i i learned like some things from watching sitcoms i'm like oh this is how people interact because i wasn't interacting with people all that much because people didn't want to interact with me and then i'm like oh wait no you can't just do this because like people get really upset when you act like life as a sitcom and make a really mean joke at them but um i'm like I know that, right? I know mm -hmm. that. But um, no, um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of overlaps. Um, and if we talk about the kind of underlying causes, there are some different ideas there, right? There's sort of one idea that there are two very separate things. There's just one underlying cause that res can result in both of them, right? That, um, you know, that there's one thing that is that can tie them together. And there's another idea that they're, they're much more related than that, right? That the causes of them are pretty sort of intertwined there. I know those sound like the same sort of thing, but they're not. Do you know what I mean there? So there could, there's one situation wherein these two unrelated things are linked by something else that has a chance of causing them both, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the other situation where <laughs> it's the same thing the, the, it's the only cause. There's one cause and it can manifest as either of them or both of them. That sounds like the same thing you're saying twice. I know it does, but it isn't. There is like <laughs> I a semantic... To it twice and it, okay. There's a semantic difference that is can very I, difficult to sort of... But can yeah, I invite my autism sense of, of analogies uh, in, into this? Well, it seems like in the first example, there's actually three things happening mm -hmm. and both ADHD and autism would be sort of if we look at evolution they would have evolved from the same common ancestor sure yeah 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 whereas the other one you're saying it's it's the same thing but two different sides of the same thing mm -hmm. so they they can either manifest on one side or the other side um or both mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's different manifestations of of yeah yeah I'm, I'm very careful when when we say it's the same thing because not the same thing we this appear is, yeah. to be validating because it's funny also cycles on tiktok because every six months there would be a new generation of 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 creators who yeah. think they've come oh i just figured it out yeah it's actually the same thing guys no, i read a wikipedia page <laughs> and i think you've all been missing something <laughs> knock 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 scientists you're wrong <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. yeah, no, sorry, go on, go on. Yeah, well, I, I was just trying to picture what you were saying, but also making sure that what either you or I are saying is not misconstrued into sounding like we are going in the direction of saying that ADHD and autism are the same thing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the difference here is that in one case, there is a third separate sort of, um, a, a sort of third separate disorder, right, that, um, is linking these two. As in, this third disorder is related to ADHD, and it could also be related to autism. And so, if this third disorder is there, then it's like, oh, well, you can maybe you can maybe both, right? And the, the alternative explanation to that is that ADHD and autism inherently share an underlying sort of cause. Now, that that's different from them both being somewhat related to this as another disorder, 
because those are three independent disorders. Mm. Having a similar underlying cause that could present in one way, another, like, could, you know, and when I say underlying cause, I mean, these are really complex genetic factors, right? So I'm not saying that these are the same thing. I'm just saying that these same factors could result in any of these different things. And that can be, that's somewhat supported. Um, again, check all of the, uh, the the links down there in the description and don't take my word for it in, entirely on this because I'm reading this from a paper and I've not studied this. So yeah. I, you know, what I'm saying could very well be not entirely correct, but there are, there are some twin studies and family studies and whatnot that kind of um, give the idea that the latter model is more likely to be correct. But again, have a look into it yourself because I find it very interesting. But also I think there's a, there's a caveat to be put here or, well, just, just be aware that, you know, looking into the causes that can very quickly devolve into um, uh, eugenics. eugenics yes Yay! so it's Our something to, topic. to keep in mind i oh. i personally am more interested in in understanding the lived experience mm -hmm. of people who are autistic or adhd or both um and looking at how we can make that experience better and 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 broaden the knowledge on what's happening currently happening rather than look into the the origins of it and the causes because very quickly and that does not happen automatically and mm. that's definitely not what you were doing but very quickly we can there can be we, we can slip into oh uh, well yeah so well if we understand the origin can we just try to make sure it doesn't happen yeah, for example know? as soon as you find out oh well this there here's the gene that causes gayness yeah well i don't want a gay kid get rid of that gene you know and that is eugenics we've spoken about that in our eugenics episode in our gay gene episode in a number of episodes actually that's why i said it's our favorite topic because it comes mm -hmm. up so bloody much we don't like eugenics we just <laughs> like talking about it so people know how horrible it is but yeah no i mean um absolutely trying to find a cause especially sort of genetic cause is a very dangerous game to play because some people are terrible <laughs> Simply yeah. put, some people are terrible. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, probably a decent place to end it. Yeah, some, yeah, people, some are people are terrible. Uh, no, uh, but I, that is probably a time to sort of bring it to a close. I mean, we've talked about a lot here. There are some, there are a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between ADHD and autism in terms of there are a lot of people who have both ADHD and autism, but that doesn't mean that ADHD and autism themselves as, as the concepts, as the disorders that we see them as are overlapping um yeah. in what they are you can very distinctly have adhd without any without like being autistic at all and vice versa but there is a unique experience that's created by both of these sort of by both of these things uh being present in one person right and that's really bloody interesting and thank you for joining us there joris there's just thank one you. thing left to do <gasps> it's a quick fire quiz dun 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 or the hd edition so the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always i'll ask one question that's one question between the two of you the first person to buzz in with the correct answer wins what do they win luke an unfollowable routine <laughs> bloody brilliant one luke what is your buzzer oh and joris what is your buzzer <laughs> much more pleasant than mine and my question for you both is Roughly, what is the range of comorbidity between ADHD and autism? Oh, let me go for it. <laughs> Sorry, Doris. Um, uh, between 37 and 70%. Oof, that was very, very close. It was actually between 37 and 78%. Oh, the flip. Oh. Joris, do you want to go in for the steal? 37 and 78. Ding, 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 oh. that is correct. Oh, well done. You win an oh, unfollowable routine. Well done. Yeah, I, I didn't do the buzz, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Joris has enough unfollowable routines as it is. <laughs> well, I think that's a good time for us to end it here. Thank you very much for joining us, Joris. Is there anywhere that people can find you? Yeah, if they look really hard. No. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm on TikTok, uh, at Joris underscore explains. I am on Instagram, Joris dot um, I have a YouTube channel, but I haven't uploaded in years. Um yeah, and all the, the Meerkat squads that uh, we regularly, regularly host. Uh, so if you Google Meerkat squad, and uh, you will probably end on the page of my colleague oh, and friend, links. Sheila Hansen. Link down below. Okay. Oh, yeah, there do that. Go. Yeah, technology, amazing. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'd like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to executive producers, Danito and Glitchrap. And thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice week comment? You can support the bottom of Patreon and go for us on side, guys. And it's like a spot on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. 
me on YouTube and at SciGuys on TikTok too. <gasps> or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod. Oh, beautiful. At gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCorey everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cutforth everywhere. Yeah, you can follow me as well, if you want. I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>